Good day and welcome to the WW International Third Quarter 2024 Earnings Conference Call. All participants will be in listen-only mode. Should you need assistance, please signal a conference specialist by pressing the star key followed by zero. After today's presentation, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. To ask a question, you may press star, then one on your telephone keypad. To withdraw your question, please press star, then two. Please note this event is being recorded. I would now like to hand the call over to David Helderman, Director of Investor Relations. Please go ahead. Thank you everyone for joining us today for WW International's third quarter 2024 conference call. This morning we issued a press release reporting our third quarter 2024 results. The purpose of this call is to provide investors with some further details regarding the company's financial results as well as to provide a general update on the company's progress. The press release is available on the company's corporate website at corporate.ww.com. Supplemental investor materials are also available on the company's corporate website under events and presentations. Reconciliations of non-GAAP measures discussed on this conference call today to the most directly comparable GAAP financial measures are also available as part of this press release. Before we begin, let me remind everyone that this call will contain forward-looking statements. Investors should be aware that any forward-looking statements are subject to various risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results to differ materially from those discussed here today. These risk factors are explained in detail in the most recently filed annual report on Form 10-K as updated by the company's other filings with the Securities and Exchange Commission. Please refer to these filings for a more detailed discussion of forward-looking statements and the risks and uncertainties of such statements. All forward-looking statements are made as of today and except as required by law, the company undertakes no obligation to publicly update or revise any forward-looking statements, whether as a result of new information, future events, or otherwise. Joining today's call are Tara Comont, Interim President and Chief Executive Officer, Heather Stark, Chief Financial Officer, and Donna Boyer, Chief Product Officer. I will now turn the call over to Tara. Thanks, David. Thank you all for joining us this morning. For those of you who don't know me, I've been a member of the Weight Watchers Board since mid-2023, and I'm now serving as Interim President and CEO following Seema Sistani's departure last month. I'm confident I speak for the entire board when I say how grateful we are to Seema for her leadership navigating the business through these times of significant change in our industry, while also laying a strong foundation for our future. I'm extremely pleased to now be part of this management team as we take on the task of building on that foundation and creating the plan to revert this business back to sustainable growth. While our results in the third quarter were broadly on track with expectations, it's clear we have significant work ahead to change the trajectory of the business. This is an industry undergoing massive transition, and as a result, Weight Watchers has experienced meaningful disruption over recent years. However, I am optimistic about our ability to lay a path to future growth. From the value of our full and expanding spectrum of solutions, to the strength of our brand and our important role in the evolving global healthcare landscape, we have the fundamentals of what we need to be successful. We know that the future of weight management is one where clinical options are paired with behavioral solutions, not either or, and that Weight Watchers is uniquely positioned to provide this to consumers at scale. This is a defining time for our field and our company. We need to ruthlessly assess and fix parts of our business not currently performing to the levels required. The team is committed to moving fast to make change, yet we know the scale of the task at hand will take time. However, let's remind ourselves that Weight Watchers has successfully navigated disruption and transformation many times in our 61 years, emerging each time with greater strength and clarity of purpose. We are confident, confident in the importance and relevance of our mission to empower people to live healthier, longer lives through our trusted leadership position and our many advantages that give us the right to win. As we look ahead to the future of this business, I see many areas of unquestionable strength. Firstly, and perhaps most importantly, we have a portfolio advantage. While many newer entrants to our space focus on just one part of our solution set, we have built with intentional breadth 
not only debt. Our full spectrum weight management platform is uniquely positioned to meet members' needs wherever they are on their weight journey. Under the leadership of Chief Product Officer Donna Boyer, who's with us on the call today, we're actively focused on making it much easier for our members to more fluidly move in and out of and across the various components of our program. We believe in building solutions for a healthy life, tailored to a member's individual needs, not isolated products for specific moments in time. This is perhaps our biggest opportunity and the area in which we have the most immediate and sizable work to do. Secondly, we have a scientific advantage. We've spent decades investing in research and development to bring our members programs that work. With over 175 published papers of clinical research and more underway specific to our GLP-1 program, we time and time again prove the efficacy of our solutions. As for one example, we know our behavioral program is three and a half times more effective for our members than trying to lose weight only with standard nutritional guidance. We also know that our Weight Watchers Clinic members taking weight loss medication paired with our Nutritional Points program, lose 11% more than those using medications alone, and that 81% of Weight Watchers Clinic members agree that compared to primary care, we provide better ongoing care and support. There are so many more proof points, and they matter more and more in a world of increasing volumes of false claims and misinformation. Thirdly, our community is a distinct advantage and a highly motivated one. We've seen 60 million plus members over our history, supported by thousands of our incredibly dedicated coaches, clinicians, care team, and field staff. Each member has access to a dynamic online community through our app, which sees high levels of engagement, as well as in-person and virtual communities through our workshops. Roughly 20% of our members at any time are on our program with a friend, and those referred by a friend have both a 20% higher retention rate and lose approximately 45% more weight by week 12 compared to other members on the program. Talk about the benefit of community. In addition, we have a vast community of prior members, a significant portion of whom return to Weight Watchers at various stages of their weight management journeys and who represent a meaningful opportunity. This is particularly evident in Weight Watchers Clinic, where over 60% of sign-ups year-to-date have come from existing and prior Weight Watchers members. Our entire business was formed on the basis of people coming together to help and support one another, and we continue to have a workshop business that, while evolving for a digital world, remains an important part of our competitive offering. Don't ever underestimate the power of an engaged community. And finally, our clear advantage with our iconic, trusted brand. We have 60 plus years of expertise and legacy, and time and time again, our consumer research has shown that we remain a brand that people trust with proven programs. We've started some initial work to refresh our brand under the leadership of our recently appointed Chief Brand Officer, Philip Picardi, to bring renewed energy to how we engage with both existing members and potential future customers. I'm excited for the first glimpse of this work during the first quarter and our peak season. While the visual updates will include a fresh direction and move us forward, our messaging will reflect the values that have always set us apart. Community, joy, and livability. Weight Watchers continue to have roughly twice the brand consideration of our nearest competitor, so we have a strong starting point from which we're excited to build upon and grow. As well as refreshing our brand, we'll be doubling down on our end-to-end marketing strategy. Too often, our marketing feels confused and lacking a clear call to action or a reason to engage. As we've expanded our solutions to include clinical and adapted to a rapidly evolving market, we need to refocus on clearly communicating the full value and breadth of our comprehensive offerings. A common theme in our focus for the coming quarters is the need to untangle complexity across different areas of our business simplifying our approach to drive improved results. Stepping back, we're confident we have the assets needed to thrive in today's high-growth weight management space. However, there's urgent and significant work ahead to bring it all together into a cohesive solution, to more effectively communicate the value and impact, and to meaningfully improve the experience once you're in the Weight Watchers ecosystem. 
We're fully committed to realizing this potential and look forward to sharing our progress along the way. Moving on to our portfolio of solutions, there's been a lot of focus on our clinical business since our acquisition of Sequence. This is an area of the market in significant demand, with some predicting that up to 30 million people in the U.S. may be using GLP-1s by 2030. As expected in early growth cycles, this surge in demand has also drawn new competitors, increasing customer acquisition costs and flooding key channels with content and information. The rapid adoption has also outpaced supply, resulting in drug shortages and prompting the introduction of compounding solutions to meet demand. To address continued drug shortages, expanding both accessibility and affordability of our clinical weight management solution, we recently added compounded semaglutide to our wide formulary of branded and other generic medications. Lack of access and affordability are the primary reasons for the churn of a clinic subscriber. The combination of a slowly improving supply trend, albeit still low, with a number of improvements in our member journey, helps us improve clinic member retention to seven and a half months in the third quarter from six and a half months in the second. In addition to shortages, insurance coverage remains a prohibitive factor for most. Over the last six months, approximately 45% of Weight Watchers clinic members eligible for and prescribed a GLP-1 by their clinician have been denied coverage by their insurance after three prior authorization requests. In fact, over 50% of current Weight Watchers members have expressed consideration of a compounded GLP-1, largely due to these factors. And that's why, after thorough research and careful evaluation, we partnered with a trusted FDA-registered 503B outsourcing facility that meets our high standards for quality and patient care. We saw an immediate and positive impact on signups in our clinical business following this launch, with the single highest day for clinic signups in 2024. Performance has continued to be positive to date, with signups remaining elevated to prior months, albeit we do not expect compounding to have a material impact on our 2024 overall business results due to the relatively small number of new clinical subscribers in proportion to our overall business. However, we're pleased to see the positive trend continue into the fourth quarter, with our clinic subscribers today representing growth from the end of Q3. We're committed to ensuring our members have access to the solutions they need while maintaining full regulatory compliance. We're optimistic that supply issues can be resolved, allowing branded medications to reach even more people who need them, and Weight Watchers is best positioned to meet that additional demand. Although competition continues to drive a significantly higher cost of acquisition compared to the same time last year, which caused us to be cautious with marketing spend in the third quarter, and ongoing medication shortages have impacted this area of our business throughout the year, we're confident in the meaningful growth opportunity the clinical offering represents for our business over the long term. While we're expanding our clinical offering, our research shows that only about 10% of GLP-1 users intend to remain on these medications for the rest of their lives. This is where the comprehensive Weight Watchers behavioral program, specifically the program we tailored for those on GLP-1s, can serve both as an effective foundation while on medication, ensuring critical complementary nutritional elements, as well as a sustainable off-ramp for these members moving forward. Moving to the rest of our platform, we must materially improve our digital member journey. We need to eliminate years of accumulated friction and more seamlessly integrate across the solution set. We make it too hard to be a Weight Watchers member today. Our vision is to create a seamless experience that allows members to explore our full range of weight management solutions from behavioral programs to clinical support and community engagement, and additional support as we add on services like registered dietitian. Our priority is to integrate and modernize so members can more easily benefit from the full suite of tools the Weight Watchers program has to offer and the results it delivers. All of this is specific to our direct consumer business. Let me talk about B2B. The emergence of effective clinical solutions is having a profound impact on both employers and payers as demand for access to weight loss medication continues to explode. We believe it's going to be increasingly hard for employers not to offer coverage for weight loss medication given their positive health benefits, particularly as more suppliers enter the markets over time and drive down cost. This represents a clear and growing long-term opportunity for Weight Watchers with the breadth and effectiveness of our program, a unique differentiator. 
Our B2B offering delivers a robust ROI for employers and insurers across all program options, with our clinic program achieving nearly a four to one payback. We're strategically adapting our solutions to meet this evolving market, led by Scott Honkin, who recently joined us as Chief Commercial Officer. Wrapping up, there's no shortage of opportunity for Weight Watchers, today and in the future, in the US and abroad. To revert this business to growth, we need to double down on our strengths and the foundation and breadth of our value proposition, which is more relevant today than ever before. We need to obsess about our member experience and leverage our full toolkit, not only its component parts. We need to be bold and clear as we engage both with our existing members and potential future customers. At a high level looking forward, we're focused on one, the simplification and integration of our digital experience, creating the ability to move easily in, out, and across all we have to offer, irrespective of where a member is on their journey. Listening to our members and truly building to the power of one Weight Watchers. Two, a revitalization of our brand, clarifying and unifying our currently disparate marketing messaging, particularly in a world of elevated CAC and prolific competition in the clinical space. Three, continuing to leverage our deep science-backed heritage in this new world of GLP-1s, not only in the doctor's office, but as a fully integrated, sustainable, and livable solution with our nutritional expertise and community support as crucial differentiators that support maximum results. Four, partnering with employers and health plans to help them provide access in an affordable and scalable manner to the tens of millions of employees and members seeking support. And five, innovating and adding to our platform where we see value for both members and our business for the short and longer term. Much of this work will take time and as we move forward, the team is taking a disciplined approach to spending and resource allocation, recognizing that some initiatives will need to be sequenced as we build for 2025 and beyond. We'll move forward thoughtfully but decisively, balancing near-term performance with investment in our future growth opportunities. And with that, let me turn it over to Heather to walk us through the core chart and our outlook in more detail. Thanks, Tara. As Tara emphasized, Despite near-term sign-up challenges, we remain confident in our strong competitive advantage, unique market position, and talented team to ultimately drive this business back to growth. We remain on track to deliver the full-year guidance that was communicated last quarter. We continue to act to improve our profitability and liquidity profile, and I'm encouraged to see our cost savings efforts bearing fruit as evidenced by our strong gross margin expansion, which sequentially increased and is up 625 basis points year-to-date versus last year. We're on track for our $100 million cost action announced last quarter, with meaningful savings in both gross margin and G&A expected in Q4 and beyond. And I'm pleased to see our average revenue per user stabilize through the first three quarters of the year, with stability being driven primarily by subscriber mix and in line with expectations. Turning to our third quarter 2024 results, Note that all year-over-year financial comparisons are on a constant currency basis. We ended Q3 with 3.7 million subscribers, a decline of 9% year-over-year, reflecting year-to-date recruitment declines as consumer acquisition costs increased substantially compared to last year. Revenue totaled 193 million. Within this, subscription revenues were 191 million, down 6% year-over-year, with declines in our digital and workshops subscription revenue. Subscription revenues benefited from 19.1 million of clinical subscription revenues. Digital and workshops revenue was primarily driven by lower signups and incoming subscribers, coupled with the continued mix shift from workshops to digital and a higher portion of digital subscribers within their initial lower price commitment periods. Clinical subscribers of 78,000 at the end of the third quarter represented growth of 71% compared to prior year, driving a $9 million increase in subscription revenue. Sign-up trends across the business have been challenging in this environment and significantly impacted by competition-driven increases to consumer acquisition costs. Other revenue of $2 million declined $10 million year-on-year due to the discontinuation of our low-margin consumer products business at the end of 2023. Adjusted gross margin was yet another record high at 69.1% for 
up from 66.2 in the prior year and 67.9 last quarter. Expansion year over year was driven primarily by actions to reduce the fixed cost base within our business and the discontinuation of our lower margin consumer products business. Marketing expenses of $44 million were down 8% year over year and almost 20% sequentially as we continue to manage to a prudent LTV CAC ratio. In the third quarter, we experienced a roughly 30% year-on-year increase in cost to acquire, which resulted in a decision to pull back marketing dollars to preserve spend for the fourth quarter, aligned with the timing of program news and creative execution, while keeping full-year spend flat to prior. Adjusted GNA of $53 million was down 7% versus prior year. Q324 GNA included a nine-month or three-quarter compensation accrual as compared to a three-month or one-quarter compensation accrual in the third quarter 2023. This resulted in higher GNA of $7 million in this year's third quarter. Excluding the $7 million impact, adjusted GNA would have decreased by 20% or $11 million versus the prior year period. The year-over-year reduction in adjusted GNA reflects the impact of our previously announced cost savings initiatives, and we are on track to achieve the run rate $100 million cost savings by the end of 2025. We expect to realize approximately $20 million of cost savings in 2024 and the remainder in 2025, with cost savings in 2025 to be split across adjusted GNA and cost of revenue with slightly more of an impact to GNA. Adjusted operating income in the third quarter was $36 million, reflecting an operating margin of 18.5%, a year-on-year increase of almost 150 basis points. Adjusted EBITDA was $40 million, which was negatively impacted by approximately $6 million of other expenses recorded below operating income, primarily driven by the negative impact of foreign currency on intercompany transactions. During Q3 2024, we recorded non-cash impairment charges of franchise rights acquired, totaling $57 million. These impairments were primarily driven by an increase in the company's weighted average cost of capital, reflecting market factors. Adjusted EPS was $0.24 and included a $0.33 tax benefit from the valuation allowance mentioned in our press release. You can find a detailed summary of the adjustments within our supplemental materials and in the financial details section of our earnings press release posted on our site earlier this morning. Shifting to our outlook for the rest of the year, while the recent launch of compounded semaglutide was encouraging in terms of momentum, we are pleased to be expanding access to medication for our members. As Tara mentioned, we expect it to have minimal impact on our consolidated 2024 results. We are reiterating our previously provided guidance for end-of-period subscribers, revenue, adjusted operating income, and adjusted EBITDA. For the full year 2024, we expect year-end total subscribers of at least 3.1 million, which represents a decline from the end of 2023 and will create a material headwind to revenue in 2025. Total revenue of at least 770 million, adjusted operating income of at least 100 million, and adjusted EBITDA of at least $150 million, which is consistent with previously provided guidance, but for clarity, now also excludes the non-cash and tangible impairment charges and former CEO separation costs that occurred in Q3. Cash outlays for the 2024 restructuring plan and remaining payments for prior year actions are expected to be approximately $30 million in 2024, with approximately $5 million remaining in Q4. Full year interest expense is expected to be between 105 and 110 million, a year over year increase of approximately 10 to 15 percent, largely driven by the expiration of our $500 million hedge at the start of Q2 2024. We expect modest benefit from the recent reduction in interest rates and remain within our prior guidance range. For the full year, we expect income tax expense of up to 10 million, excluding the impact of the valuation allowance impairments, and other discrete tax items, we continue to expect an income tax benefit of up to $10 million. We expect cash taxes, net of refunds, to be approximately $20 million for the year. As anticipated and communicated in prior quarters, we are pleased to see cash flow from operations improve and revert to positive in the third quarter. We continue to expect to have a modest use of cash from operations for the full year 2024. 
As a reminder, our business is a highly cash generative business pre-debt servicing charges and is bolstered by our subscription billing model and the stickiness of our subscriber base. CapEx, which is primarily capitalized software, is expected to be approximately 20 million. Depreciation and amortization is expected to be around 40 million. Turning to our capital structure, we ended Q3 with approximately 57 million of cash, up from 43 million at the end of the second quarter, plus undrawn revolver access of 61 million. With our cash position plus our revolving credit facility and bolstered by the cost actions underway, we believe we have sufficient liquidity for our working capital needs, including cash outlays related to our headcount actions and servicing our debt. We have attractive debt terms with no maturities for our term loan or senior notes until 2028 and 2029. However, we acknowledge that our debt burden is significant. With our net debt to adjusted EBITDA leverage ratio at 10.4 times, at the end of the third quarter. As such, we have recently appointed advisors to assist us in the evaluation of options related to our overall capital structure. We have nothing further to share on this at this time. 2024 reflects a focus on profitability as we navigate a challenging sign-up environment in a rapidly changing industry, and we remain on track with our prior expectations. I have confidence we are taking the right steps that will best enable the company to revert to growth while managing liquidity and setting us up for longer-term success. I'll now turn the call back to Tara. Thanks, Heather. For over six decades, Weight Watchers has helped tens of millions of people transform their lives through our proven approach to weight management. As we navigate an evolving health landscape, it's crucial that we return to those core strengths that have defined Weight Watchers from the beginning. Innovation, continuous learning, a commitment to science-backed solutions, the importance of community, and livable solutions for a healthy life. As interim CEO, I'm fully focused on leading the company through this next phase and driving meaningful progress in these strategic initiatives over at least the next six months. I'm honored to work with our team on behalf of our current and future members in this incredible company. With that, we'll be happy to take questions. We will now begin the question and answer session. To ask a question, you may press star then one on your telephone keypad. If you are using a speakerphone, please pick up your handset before pressing the keys. To withdraw your question, please press star then two. At this time, we will pause momentarily to assemble the roster. And our first question will come from Nathan Feather of Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Hey, everyone. Thanks for the question. Um, it would be helpful to get your thoughts on what has worked early in the compounding launch across, you know, conversion, retention, and the ability to market and taking that together. Are, are you seeing meaningful uplift in LTV to CAC there? Uh, hey, hey, Nathan. Um, uh, yeah, listen, we, um, as we mentioned on the call, we were extremely pleased um, with the launch of Compounding, which was really only a few weeks ago at this point. Um, and I really give the team here a huge amount of credit um, for the extensive work and diligence um, that went into that launch over many, many months. Um, and actually, Donna, your team led that work, so perhaps you want to comment on some of those positive trends. We also gave some of those statistics in the call, um, but you want to add some further color? Sure, I'm happy to. Thanks for the question. Immediately after our compounding launch, we saw a positive impact on both our signups and our PAC. Our launch day was our highest, as Tara mentioned, our, very, our single highest launch in 2024, and we are cont continuing to see signups that are exceeding our end of Q3 trends. Um, as to the success, there's, there's multiple factors there. One is really the, the offering of um, compounded semaglutide in itself, uh, resolving shortages. That has been a challenge for conversion overall. So having the availability of supply has contributed to that. In addition to that, though, um, a combination of always looking at our pricing strategy and the um, availability of flexibility of um, how members are able to access that in combination with, as Tara mentioned, some of the friction on our website and our conversion funnels have been resolved with 
uh, with this launch. So they primarily the availability of the drug, um, being able to provide members access has been a, a factor in and of itself, coupled with some of the member experience changes that we've seen affecting uh, affecting both conversion and with that, in turn, tax. I would just add to that, um, thanks, Donna, just an overall reminder that we don't expect this to have a material impact to the overall business uh, due to the uh, proportion of clinic versus behavioral uh, subscribers at this time. Okay, great. That's all helpful. And then, um, sorry, you walked through a lot of initiatives in the pipeline at, at various different timelines. I guess in your term, what are the, you know, maybe two or three primary priorities that you're looking to get in place ahead of peak season to hopefully drive some of the acceleration and, you know, the core clinical? Sorry, was that, um, Nathan, that I, I missed the beginning of the, the question. Was that specific to our clinical business or a more general question? More general, just kind of the, the key priorities ahead of peak. Yeah, absolutely. Well, listen, I think um, uh, we spoke to many of them on the phone, um, you know, in the, in the prepared remarks. Um, and I think what you're hearing is a focus on awareness of the breadth and strength of our offering. And while that may seem somewhat obvious, um, you know, I, I think we've, we haven't done as good a job as we could have done reminding the market of all that is part of the full spectrum of Weight Watcher solutions. We actually have a very low awareness, for example, around the fact that we even have a clinical solution. Um, and so when we think about peak, we're really going to be doubling down on those core strengths, um, the values of the Weight Watchers platform that have always been in place. You know, this is livable, this is not a fad, this is, these are solutions for life. Um, but we're also going to be very focused on awareness um, and engagement as we as we really hammer home that um, that messaging. Um, I mentioned a brand refresh. We're not doing any major rebranding, but you know I think the brand um, refresh is going to be fantastic. I'm looking forward to seeing it in the first quarter. You know, a little more modern, a little more Weight Watchers, um, a little more human, um, a lot more community, a lot more joy, um, and just sort of getting back to the roots of who we are but certainly with a focus on the breadth of all we, of all we bring um, to offer. Great. Very helpful. Thank you. Welcome. The next question comes from Alex Furman of Craig Hallam Capital Group. Please go ahead. Hey, guys. Thanks for taking my question. Uh, wanted to ask about retention on the clinical side of the business, I think you mentioned that you've seen retention improve from six and a half months to seven and a half months. Um, can you give us a little bit of color on why your clinical members are typically churning out? Is, is it a matter of side effects or having reached their weight loss goals, or, or is it more about cost and access? And how has that been evolving over the course of the year? Yeah, um, hey Alex. Uh, I mean, I think um, we we maybe said it in the script, but it's absolutely um, cost and access. Um, they are the biggest contributing factors to why a clinical subscriber churns. So as we've launched compounding, um, but also as, as Donna alluded to, some additional product um, improvements just in the member experience. Um, those are really, it's super encouraging to see those have such a tangible and immediate impact on our attention. Okay, that's, that's really helpful to hear. Um, and then is it your kind of, um, you know, hope or expectation going forward that longer term you could get clinical retention, you know, up above and beyond what, what you see or, or up to the levels that you see in the clinical program or, or you know, is it more about, I guess, kind of keeping, keeping people on the, um, you know, the, the traditional program as well when they, when they transition off the clinical program as a means of keeping them engaged with the brand? Absolutely. Um, the latter. So, look, we, um, we gave you a stat that about 10% of our GLP-1 members do not intend to remain on those meds for life. Um, and again, when we talk about building to one Weight Watchers, we are talking about being able to meet members wherever they are on their, on their weight journey. That may be entering the Weight Watchers ecosystem at a point where um, you're looking for uh, uh, medication solutions. 
but the pairing of those with our nutritional program, both while you're on medication and as you ramp off medication for the longer term, we believe is a really, really critical part of this solution here for our members um, and, and ultimately successful long-term outcomes. So, look, we're not giving any targets today on, on um, things like retention, um, but suffice to say that, yeah, we're very optimistic and ambitious about what this business can look like over the long term. Okay, that's, that's really helpful. Thank you very much. The next question comes from Karu Martinson of Jefferies. Please go ahead. Good morning. Uh, when we kind of do this rebranding, the building to a one Weight Watchers, I mean, how much of the $80 million in cost cut uh, savings that you're looking at for 2025 will, will need to be kind of reinvested in the business and how much will come to the bottom line? Hey, crew. Um, you know, we definitely looked at investment needed as we were designing the $100 million cost action. There, you know, there is investment required uh, as we build into next year. And, uh, you know, we, we are um, not guiding to 2025 at this time, but mm -hmm. we are absolutely laser focused on profitability and managing our liquidity through the turnaround. Uh, and we expect to see that full uh, run rate, $100 million uh, cost savings, reading through by the end of 2025. And when we look at that liquidity, we feel comfortable that we can you know, carry that liquidity, let's say, at least to the revolver maturity. Yeah, we know we've, we've shared our comfort with our cash and liquidity position, and it, it, we've, we've – uh, We've designed our, our cash management and cost management uh, exercise with that in mind. I would, you know, as we look through the year, remind you that our first half of the year is heavier cash use um, than the back half of the year, but also remind you that we're a cash generative business and, um, you know, working through the, the $100 million uh, cost savings to, to preserve uh, liquidity through the turnaround. And, and hey, Chris, the only thing I would add to that is, look, I, uh, speaking personally, I'm four weeks into this role. Mm -hmm. um, John, I think you're, what, six months? So this is your first, you know, both of our first 2025 planning season at Weight Watchers. Um, and, um, you know, I really do give the team a lot of credit for the tough decisions they took as it relates to those cost actions. But we absolutely will also be investing in the business um, throughout 2025 to get this business back to growth. We see huge opportunity um, in terms of really leveraging the assets we already have. Um, so as Heather said, we're not guiding to 2025 today, and we'll be going through our strategic planning um, and those budget allocations over the next couple of months and updating you um, in Q1 next year. Okay, and just lastly, in terms of those consumer acquisition costs, I mean, have you seen any change um, in the overall competitive market as – you know, uh, I think it was um, Zepbound and others came off of, um, of the shortage list. Uh, is that having any impact on the competitive response out there? Yeah, so, you know, expectations at the start of the fourth quarter, uh, we're definitely seeing some, seeing some early relief uh, from the significant increases we referenced having seen last quarter. Uh, but look, CACs are still elevated. There's There's competition and noise in this. Space. It's evolving, and we are managing through that, and managing through that uh, prudently. You know, working to compete more effectively uh, where the LTV CAC uh, makes better sense, and um, and and going from there. Um, but the you know the move to offering uh, compounding as well, uh, our, our ability to speak to one Weight Watchers um, is is reading through. And as I said, there's there's still pressure, but um, as I said, the, the start of the fourth quarter, some early relief. Thank yeah, you very much. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, I was just going to add to that as a general comment, not a not a sort of specific one, but as a general comment. Um, uh, you know, we have the ability to ease our marketing efficiency and effectiveness as we become more cohesive in how we both. Um, build our product when you land somewhere in the Weight Watchers ecosystem and as we communicate our product. So I just want to make that point. It doesn't change the scale and the impact of the competitive um, market around us, but I do think there are things that uh, Donna in particular and her team um, and Phil and his team and the marketing crew that we can do um, to make life a little easier for ourselves in that competitive environment as it relates to elevated CAC. 
Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Welcome. The next question comes from Michael Lasser of UBS. Please go ahead. Good morning. This is Henry Caron from Michael Lasser. Thanks so much for taking our questions. Uh, I wanted to start just by asking, you know, what gives you confidence that employers will need to offer more weight loss solutions to employees in the future? And why is Weight Watchers positioned well to be part of that solution? Um, yeah, hey, Henry. Um, look, we um, were pretty early here in the overall innings in terms of how uh, obesity meds fit within this marketplace. And obviously, insurance coverage remains pretty low right now, particularly given the high cost. Um, but we believe that ultimately uh, employers and insurers are going to really struggle and find it very hard not to cover these medications in light of their broad health benefits. So we do think that there are real tailwinds in this space. It's obviously a longer lead, term, lead, longer lead time, but we're, we're super bullish on this um, over future years and particularly our, our position in this marketplace with the breadth of that offering. I think employers are looking for a much more extensive suite of solutions than, um, than a single uh, point solution, and certainly that's where Weight Watchers really, really plays. Um, so we've, we feel good about this over the long term. And just add to that, too, we've, we've seen a positive uh, fourth quarter selling season. Uh, we do expect that to read through into 2025 with uh, newly contracted and expanded channel partnerships and direct-to-employer relationships. Uh, but as a reminder, we're building off a small base, and we do expect uh, the pace of growth in B2B. While we're, we're bullish on the opportunity, we do expect it to be gradual. Yeah, for sure. Great. Thanks so much. And uh, I just wanted to ask uh, a little bit more about the acquisition. Uh, I believe they were up 30% year over year. Uh, with marketing spend being shifted into 3 q not exactly panning out, was uh, a lot of that due to just increased expenses related to the election, um, you know, and, and digital channels? And should this abate moving forward and into 2025? Um, any clarity about how that's trended and, and what could come would be super helpful. Thank you. Sure. You know, it, we're seeing this as largely competition in the space, driving costs to acquire up. There's obviously media inflation going on in the space as well um, across channels. I don't see this defined as, as one channel. Uh, I think the U.S. election uh, potentially impacted it as well, um, and, and that threw into the start of the fourth quarter as well. Um, but as I mentioned before, our, our expectations for the fourth quarter um, as we referenced, uh, we do see some early relief there, uh, but uh, I would say the tax are still elevated uh, going into the fourth quarter. Great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. This concludes our question and answer session. I would like to turn the call over to Tara Kalman for any closing remarks. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Um, we really appreciate you joining us this morning, uh, particularly on as busy a morning as it is here in the U.S. Um, and look forward to following up with you over the course of the quarter and in our call next quarter. So thanks, everyone. The conference has now concluded. Thank you for attending today's presentation, and you may now disconnect. <laughs>